I've heard people say uh, when they die that they're going to somehow get, we sometimes imagine the pearly gates and they're going to say to God, God, you've got some explaining to do. And then list off the laundry list of things that just don't make sense to us in this world. Some of it's going to be the wonder of the cosmos. Some of it's going to be the blades of the grass. And some of it, if we're honest, is going to be some of the more difficult things on our journey. The inconsistencies that we see over our lifetime, the prevalence of evil, and all the sorrow we bear will come how somehow into focus. We pray, we hope, we believe in the fullness of time. We know that we look for touchstones on this journey, uh, indication of God's presence deeply within and around us in order to see us through the spaces of our hardship. And we know, many of us know ourselves or know others who look to a place of that touchstone itself in scripture. Scripture can be a place of direction and of hope for so many in times of trial as we seek to run perseverantly the race this life that we have been gifted. We also find, can we be honest, that the Bible is riddled with problematic stories, stories that seem to justify violence and stories that ascribe vindictive and violent attributes to God. They don't seem to make sense to our ears, and we somehow trust that they may have made more sense to a different culture and different ears that have come on long before us, and yet they have endured. And what does it mean that they endure for us today and we are told that they serve as a beacon and a guiding light for us. Now, those of us who grew up hearing and reading these stories, perhaps in some form of what Sandy is doing with the children today, sometimes we forget the deeper places and the most extreme places that we often cut out and don't share, right, in these spaces because they are so bloody or they feel too remote and often describe ways of God that don't feel true to our own experiences or we don't want them to feel true to our experiences. There are no shortage, as we said, problematic texts in the Bible. A couple of weeks ago now on October 16th, we were with the Israelites as our narrative keeps on building upon each other on the other side of the Exodus after they've been through so much and they've emerged through the wilderness. We shared a text from Joshua including chapter 24. When the Israelites were recommitting themselves to God, it becomes something of a quaint passage. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, right? But included in this passage, right there in the text, was the conquest over many other tribes and peoples. We hear the Israelites catalog militaristic and murderous success against their foes with indication from the writers that this represents a blessing and even a handing over of these people with a victory from God. Now on that day, we ended up focusing more on the vulnerable times of the Israelites and tried to pull back and remember them in the wilderness and their vulnerability before these battles when God provided water in the wilderness to quench their thirst. What about the quenching of the thirst of those whom they had defeated? Now, we were amiss in including those passages about conquest, and we want to admit to you that not commenting further into them left some unanswered questions. We, as a worship task group, had spent an entire Bible study, an hour separate from our usual planning time, delving into how problematic they were. We saw in the text conqueror language akin to the genocidal apologetics that have unfolded throughout history. And if we were to include it, we needed to share with you our blistering critique, which we did not. But we share it today that reading such texts invites us to name the hard truths we know closer to home and in our time, including the systemic oppression and driving out of native peoples in this country. We can point to the utilization of scripture to subjugate African peoples with colonizers perversely claiming slavery as part of God's will. And scripture is still invoked as a bludgeon to justify hate, violence, and war. There are dangerous examples today, including theologies of exceptionalism employed in Russia and the tentacled legacy of white supremacy and Christianity in this country. Scripture with the building of narrative blocks over time, is a devastating story of victors. 
and the both and a part of what makes the many layered text unique is that the Bible is also the stories of the vanquished from slavery to land holding, from exile to rebuilding, from freedom to occupation. And in the lifetime of Jesus, we see the oppression and tyranny of the Roman Empire. Jesus writes from an occupied land, from the perspective of an occupied people, and ultimately as a victim of state-sanctioned violence and death. We go back to Jerry's questions as we come to the text today. Where is the both andedness of this? Where is the reality of our human condition and the things that come about that put us in war and conflict with one another that evil would prevail? And where is it that God is active as we try to tell our stories? In the case of those committing records to the written page today, we believe that a passage like the one from Solomon dates to about 400 BCE or so or 400 years after Solomon, so around the 6th and 7th century, it is likely that writers were trying to provide an explanation for why the southern kingdom of Judah fell at the hands of Babylon, because that had unfolded and happened as they were writing these texts. And they were trying to build their stories on previous texts and oral traditions, piecing them together and trying to get a sense of who they were and who God was calling them to be. Solomon was the most rich and powerful of Israel's kings, so naturally he needs a very prominent place in the scripture, an explanation of how it was he got to be how he was. That's why 2 Kings gives accounts of Solomon's reforms extensively following this, his defensive measures, his taxation, and his foreign alliances. He was an ambitious and talented strategist. And so I believe in part to explain why Solomon is just so darn successful, we see here a dream that reveals the emphasis emphasis on Solomon's wisdom and on God's blessing with him. It is helpful, I think very helpful to note here that Solomon has been up to some not so great things when this dream comes about. In the verses that come before, not only has he made alliance with Egypt, yes, that Egypt of the enslaving of his previous generations of his people by taking on a foreign bride. But he has also he's also been worshiping in the high places. This is coded in the text. You might not realize it at first, but when it says the high places, these are not Jerusalem. He was going out into cultic places where it was known that other gods were often revered, and he was going there. We're told at the end of this passage that he goes back to Jerusalem in front of the ark, but he had this predilection for going out to the high places. We know that this is a dream that also will help us in grounding who he is and giving us assurance, even when we see him do things later that we do not, I think this day, revere the conscription of labor forces for his vast, vast building projects, the enlargement of foreign wives and concubines, hundreds and hundreds in the making, and the building of his temple before he builds the temple of God. The dream passage today we see seeks to solidify solidify Solomon's relationship with God as both a means to explain his extreme success and his excess over a lifetime. If he's just so special that no one else is like him, can you believe that text? (laughs) Then it justifies all of these things. Yeah, can you believe it? then it justifies all these things that he has both done and undertaken in the name seemingly of that steadfast love he has of God. Friends, let's take a pause for us. Is there something redemptive here for us? Something that we can point to that helps us to understand something about God's activity in history and our very own struggles to be encountering of God today? What can serve as a living living testament of Solomon's life that can inform the wisdom that we seek? What is unique here, as we pointed out, is Solomon's request as portrayed by the authors because he makes it not just for himself and his rule, but we are told he makes it on behalf of others. He requests a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. 
seemingly not to just build up his own knowledge and his own comfort, but also then to take that knowledge and employ it to the betterment of others. Not just to have knowing of stuff for its own sake, but employing that and gaining that others might also benefit. Did he always do this just right? No, he did not. But it's telling to us that the authors chose to highlight this as something that they would extol and want to see from their leaders. And that would be the for the people who are trying to make a life after Babylon. To use what God has given for the betterment of others means that going forward, visions and dreams can occupy our imaginations. What we find so compelling about his story today is it's less about the action he takes, which is found in chapters and chapters thereafter, but it's more about this pausing for the intention that he makes. For this, we find, as we're told by the authors, is pleasing to God. What is pleasing to God today? We are told over and over in scriptures here in this passage, but then all throughout about the justice and righteousness that God would be seeking to bring about among God's people. We see it in the lives of leaders and prophets that are extolled when they point to the reality, not of power and prestige for its own sake, but a life that points its way to a broader claim of God's kingdom lived out here on earth. We see this through the life of Christ and his humble seeking to be with those who no one else wanted to be with his going and kneeling before those who are in pain, his speaking truth to power, and his persistence ongoingly into the challenges of his day. Now, you may have heard in the last many months and years through Jewish tradition, the idea that someone's life, once they have passed, we might say unto someone, may their life be for a blessing. May their life be for a blessing. You may have heard this often as Ruth Bader Ginsburg had died. You had heard this from Jewish community about may her life be a blessing. Looking at a leader who had dedicated her life, policies you may or not agree with, but someone as a dedicated public servant. Think of a public servant in your own mind who had given all that they had been gifted, the wisdom and everything that they had endowed in their mind and spirits and dedicated it not only for the advancement of their own lives, but for the advancement of so many others as they discerned it for themselves. Jewish author Molly Conway writes in the wake of Ruth Bader Ginsburg's passing about righteousness, righteousness as we might see it pursued in biblical texts and here with Solomon. It is to be viewed as a balancing of the scales and active working towards justice. She goes on to cite an example that I think speaks home today, given our day one resource involvement. She says, giving to a food bank is not done in order to get in good with God and be nice to the less fortunate. She, she writes that we give because it is unjust for anyone to be without food, especially when others have plenty. Correcting injustice, balancing the scales, Evaluating the distribution of power and creating equity is the work of righteousness. If we say that someone is a righteous person, it means not just that someone was good or nice. We're saying that that person was a thoughtful person who worked tirelessly to create a more just world. I want to take a moment and pause with that. To be righteous, and this might be a lesson that we would learn from Solomon today and his pursuits, not always getting it right, but persevering to be a thoughtful person who worked tirelessly to create a more just world, a world that would perpetuate equality and access, one that isn't reliant on charity, one that was better for people than when she began, when we began, without the expectation of praise or fame. Friends, as we come to the All Saints table today, we want to pause and really allow to sink in the both and reality that comes in our relationships, both with God and with those who have gone before. 
As we recognize those who have passed, we know that sometimes there's a thorny road that has been traveled in relationship. Sometimes these things are complicated, and I want to name today that relationship with the Bible is complicated. <laughs> if we dare to continue to stay curious, perhaps like me who identifies as a Christ follower, it's it's often because I still feel like these words in this script are speaking to me because of the challenges, because of the challenges I see today, I see challenges in the Bible and think that God is still informing the wisdom that we can bring to bear. This, I believe, is the legacy of Solomon. As we think out to the legacy and the wisdom of those who have passed, what do we seek to carry forward? And how does what we seek to carry forward speak to the benefit of all of God's beloved? There will continue to be war upon war. We will continue to have the poor in our midst. But how are we called in the spirit of justice and righteousness to be the lights, the lights that can shine in those places of hunger, of disease, of uncertainty, of doubt.